Welcome back to episode two of the El Segundo podcast. We flew out to LA and we tracked down Josh Barnett, one of the most influential grapplers in all of combat sports. This guy had a huge career. He started fighting back in like 97. UFC started 93 for a frame of reference. He fought in the UFC pre-Dana White. He fought in Japan in Pride, which was probably the biggest spectacle I've ever seen in terms of combat sports. He went back to UFC, had a crazy career, but we all owe him a huge thank you. And this is why he's my favorite fighter. He killed a t-shirt company called Affliction. If you don't know what that is, Google it. One of the ugliest t-shirts I've ever seen. He was involved in fighting for the Affliction organization. Something happened, cost him a lot of money. Affliction is no longer around. We all owe you a huge thank you for that, Josh Barnett. Um, Josh Barnett, interesting figure in grappling. He won IBGF black belt welds without a black belt. Absolutely crazy to think about that. And I also ask him a question I've been wanting to ask catch wrestlers for a long, long time. Why are you all so sensitive on the internet? Guys, this was a fun one. Please download this episode. Don't just watch it. Download it too. You are now listening to the Segundo Podcast with... Who? Craig Jones. Who? Craig Jones. <laughs> and um, uh, having that guy around is the best thing that ever happened for the squad. El Secundo podcast is back again, supporting feminism in the modern world. This week, I thought I was going to bring you a new OnlyFans model, but Shots of Simone is back again. She's back because she's an ASMR specialist, and she sent me a particular video, and I'm going to play it for you right now. She showed me that she can do a 100% spot on Gabby Garcia impression. Let's have a listen. <laughs> If that doesn't get you hard, I don't know what will, but definitely support Shots of Simone. We did hours and hours of research to find this account, and all I'm asking is that you subscribe to our free OnlyFans profile, or at the very least, follow her on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. I hear she has a lot of fun on those live streams. All right, guys, we're here uh, with Josh Barnett, the scariest man. I think I've ever grappled. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my buddy was asking me about that the other day. He's like, you guys going balls out? Like, no, mainly, like, I, and I told him ahead of time, I said to Craig, I'm just coming to steal your shit. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> I just want to steal your things and feel what it is that you do and how you think and try to, like, get an idea, like, okay, well, who's Craig Jones as a grappler? Of course, as we can see, it's still changing. And, uh, hell, I'd like to think that I'm a part of that because... We were down there, and I remember what we're rolling, we're working. You, you, I'm feeling you're hitting these different sweep options. I'm going, okay, yeah, he's, he's he's really heavy on hand control, super smart there. He's doing manipulating the hips, which is normal, but the hand control stuff that he's using, like, okay, I can I can see what his personal uh, take on this is. And he had to go and get on my back, and I would just okay. Whoop get to my knees, pop you off, and then stand up and go over again. Over and over and over and over again. And, I'm like, and then uh, and then all of a sudden I see the new DVD, just stand up. <laughs> I go. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's, Love it. That's my whole philosophy in the sport is like I try to steal things from other people, rename it, and say it with an Australian accent. People are like, you stand up. Yeah, but you don't put cunt on the end of all of your stuff. So how uh, Aussie could it be? That's true. That that gets taken down off Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. It's it's a. I guess it's an understood. Like everything ends in cunt. You know. <laughs> it's true. Good cunt, bad cunt, shit. Yeah, cunt, soft cunt. cunt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We don't want any of this. Oh, by the way, uh, so we're at an Airbnb, everyone, and this chair has been fucked in thoroughly to the point that I am. I feel like the ass end of this thing is going to fall out and it is quite rickety. This couch has had like 17 pillows stuffed underneath it. it had so many drunken forays and, and he just got here. Yeah. We just, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, it was, well, I think at the same time, um, I think, yeah, we talk about stealing and we're always stealing from each other. Um, but what you steal is it depends on who you're around, right? So even if, you know, Nikki's a wrestler by trade, but a lot of times wrestlers get into the grap the submission wrestling game, and especially 
from a jujitsu perspective. And now they're like, ah, that is, I, I, I can never give up my back now. And so then you'll see wrestlers playing off of their back. Everybody needs a well-rounded game. You got to be able to hit everything from anywhere. You always need something in your back pocket from whenever it's available. But you'll see them then throw away a lot of that wrestling fundamentals. And But yet, you know, I feel like, well, if I'm coming around and guys like yourself are even like, all right, jump on his back. I'm like, fuck, well, how does he keep throwing me off? It's like, well, it's just because I'm using, I'm understanding of the game and the sport, but I'm not... I'm not re reinventing the wheel for myself. I'm just going back to what I already trained. Yeah. And really, if we really think about it, like all of these different wrestling styles all interplay with each other yeah. and, and fit in. You know, only the rules will really ultimately determine like what you're really going to try and dare for and what you won't. For sure. And it's good to just break the rules, you know, like uh, traditional jiu-jitsu guys always be like, never expose your back. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, if you never expose your back, you might never get up. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have someone with one, even one hook in, put them in a position where they're falling and their hands are preoccupied mm -hmm. by hanging on. Yes. Then I concede to my back and then I'm stuck with that weight completely on top of me. Exactly. And it's like this consideration that, well, if he doesn't get your back, then of course you'll work all these other techniques. It's like, bro, he fucking does all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say it's um, Sally Hibeto. Like, he's going to ride the ever living shit out of you and you're never going to get rid of him unless you create some sort of dynamic movement to get that guy off your back. You know, I was uh, teaching a little while back to the fighters about lasso or seatbelt. I go, this is not a ride. Do not use this as a ride. You, if, you, if you go for it, you're coming across the body, you need to suck them back into the back tape right away. If you try to ride from here, unless this person sucks at any wrestling, you're fucked. They're out, they're gone, you're not doing anything with this. You need to go right into your attack. This is not a ride position. Uh, I go, if you really want to secure the back, get double unders. I go, watch Sully Hibero win an ADCC championship, taking the guy's back, double under, locks his hands, and he just hangs on. Time expires, the dude was never able to get away. And obviously you need to have Sully Hibero level skills to do that, but at the top of the top of the top of the top, simple, Double underhook, locked hands. You knew he wasn't going to go and try and choke him, but he got his points. Yeah. You're fucked now, you know, and points are pressure. So now it's under you to do something. But back to what you're saying about jujitsu guys saying never give up your back, never, ever, ever, like this being like one of the Ten Commandments of, of jujitsu. Well, if you never really fight out of like really start making shit happen, well, then you're going to be stuck with Sal Ibero locking his hands, double unders and losing. I'd rather fucking give it all I got and go out there and lose. And just because I was too afraid to try something or, you know, I thought that that was taboo. And, and you know, what's funny is the same thing is said about Keza. Like, don't go to Keza Gatame. Don't go to Head and Armour. You'll just get your back taken. And I always took that as, oh, you just don't know how to do it. And so it's better for you to teach your students not to use it because you couldn't teach them to be good with it. You would only teach them to be mediocre and get, and get beaten by it. Or, or get beaten by using it, getting their back taken. Whereas for me, I'm like, fuck yeah, man. If you understand this ride, everyone's life sucks. For sure. I would always like, uh, I might take wrestlers backs when they do like a uh, average, like uh, headlock sort of throw. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if a guy's really established the Keza, I would get stuck in there. And it would be kind of very frustrating position to try to get out of. It would be way easier to pin you by getting into Keza while on the ground than by in motion. Because in motion, things are just that, in motion. And so with your instincts, I would personally expect you'd be able to start trying to create something, get a hook in somewhere halfway, uh, start squirming on space. I mean, I dove on a toehold wrestling with you and you managed, you were like, okay, boop, and you put your foot right in the crook of the knee so that I couldn't finally get a lock on the leg to isolate it. And it's like that kind of little detail will make all the difference where someone else just gets fucking tossed being like well okay here's what it is here's where we're going but we're not 100 percent there we're like 85 and within that little 15 percent gap there's something that can be done to give that space and at the best of the best of the best it's all in the margins anyways 
And it's obviously also good that like we don't rip shit on each other because then <laughs> I can actually that explore sucks. a little bit of that late stage of scare. I used oh. to train where people would rip stuff and I, as soon as I like got my arms separated from Amber, I'd be like, tap, tap, don't hurt me. But obviously like you train with the high level guys that are very concerned about injuring each other. They give you a bit of wiggle room there. They test the control. You get a test the late stage of scare. Yeah, uh, you should figure that in that kind of training scenario, unless you've got something fully deep in to where you could so deep that you actually have great control over it, you're not, no one's winning a belt, no one's getting a medal and no one's getting paid. So that isn't the time to try and like take one home. And it, it honestly takes, it takes a lot of time to learn that, not just from a skill perspective. I think it takes time to learn it from uh, an ego perspective and being confident enough in yourself that you don't have to go out there and like, oh, I gotta prove everything all the time. It's like, how about you learn right now? How about you see, not even see, like let your body show you what this guy is doing. Try to feel it out because you won't forget that. He could describe it every way from Sunday and you won't remember half of it. But if you're constantly in those reps and feeling what's happening, now you have a chance of like of integrating that into what you do, and it takes it takes patience and it, and it takes a kind of focus that I think you it has to come from someone that's been on the mat long enough and has you know I'm not trying to say like destroyed their ego like we've all got an ego while we're there but your ego should be uh, oriented towards your development not towards whether or not Craig Jones or somebody else thinks. You, you could have beat them or something like who fucking cares yeah. all right like that's nobody really wins oh i, I won this dojo match <laughs> hooray <laughs> how much did you make off of that <laughs> oh. <laughs> well i mean in a grappling match it could still be zero yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly zero right zero <laughs> don't i know it yeah <laughs> Go, go uh, win, Metamor win a Metamorphs match. Oh, and, <laughs> I still haven't been. I, I got paid for the first one, not the second one. Still waiting on that oh, one. Man. Well, I ain't waiting on it. <laughs> but it's it's out there in the ether somewhere. I'm surprised Helic doesn't have that uh, rap money. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, yeah, what, that was, I must have got a, a lot of internet clout. <laughs> and we know how, how well that spends. Maybe he just spent it all on uh, fancy watches. Uh a blinged out gi, <laughs> all the kind of things you need for the hip hop uh, jujitsu. <laughs> <The culture. laughs> Where's Kit Dale? No, no, if you're Where's within, Kit? if we're within like ten miles of an Aussie, you got to hang out with each other. I know I haven't seen him this year. <laughs> hey, we we lost He's a lot of time. Jack. He's Jack, is he? I haven't yeah, seen him for a he's pretty Jack. He's a strangely built guy. I always found it difficult to roll with because his limbs were short and thick, but his torso was super long. Yeah, he's pretty mm -hmm. long. So I always found it hard to like find space on him mm -hmm. but he would have a weirdly long reach because his torso would go so far he used to beat the shit out of me in Australia <laughs> all the time this bastard <laughs> for years he's he's a really great training partner speaking of people that, that's great to work with I've had so many roles with Kit and just just such a master on the mat and such awareness and skill and, and he's always developing. Like he went on a huge wrestling kick uh, over the last, I, I don't know if he's still on it, but for like a good three, four years. And it was really impressive to see what he was integrating into his game and the, the habits he was at building with it. It was really dope. Yeah. And, and which, which I could say like, if, if you're kind of out of competition, you know, this is more likely, but uh, it's always good to see when people don't just stay in their in their wheelhouse for their strengths and start adding other stuff to it you know because at the end of the day i mean if you're just a competitive athlete okay but martial arts is supposed to have a martial side to them and you know we live in a weird ass world and you could absolutely get your ass attacked <laughs> out yeah, on the yeah, yes. here, yeah. i book an airbnb it has the address I wouldn't say where, but it was close to yeah. where you told me it lives <laughs> we drive all the way there from santa barbara to dad get there and it's a DMV. Yeah. And I was like, that's strange. Let me, <laughs> let me open the Airbnb message. And the guy's first line is, the Airbnb isn't at this address. It's at this address. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. I better call Josh. <laughs> let Josh know. Oh, yeah. God. It's like, uh, I mean, that's a, it's a really wacky way of doing things. I got to be perfectly honest. But 
Oh, people love it when I wear my Mexican ground karate. Oh yeah, uh, rap star at practice. <laughs> <laughs> all my all my little all my little homies. There's like that's funny. A lot of people got upset with me. They're like, Craig, you can't say that. Is that racist? All this stuff. But What's every racist Mexican about I met, it? they loved it. Yeah, I know. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's just silly. It's just like you <laughs> just stupid. Yeah. yeah. You just got to say you're like half Mexican, and it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Never let it do it. Yeah. Exactly. A little Aussie, a little Mexican in you. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been in uh, LA? Because you're from Seattle, right? Yeah, I've been here. Um, I think on that. I think I've been here 17 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I love the Pacific Northwest. Um, I always consider myself a Seattleite, although I guess I've been here long enough and ingrained in the culture long enough that I am kind of an Angelino as well. But uh, it just the support for what we were doing, even though the Pacific Northwest and even in and around Seattle has had a lot of UFC champs yeah. and, and high level martial arts champions from around the, the ages. But there just wasn't any support for it up there. So I could come down here on a training trip with Eric Paulson and there's massage therapists that just want to work on you pro bono. There's people that will do this, a smoothie shop, all these different kind of things that you don't normally think about, but when they become available to you, right? When, when these, you see how there are these people out there that want to just be a part of the ride and willing to help you with this, uh, it makes a huge difference only to go back up to Washington and, and like nobody gives a shit yeah. and just thinking like well if I really want to do this I need I didn't have the training partners I needed and um, the infrastructure just really wasn't there so it didn't it, it made sense to me that I needed to be down here there was and especially at the time there were there were more gyms and there was more heavyweights and there's a lot more going on going on down here and then even people from Vegas could get over to Southern California really easily versus say if I'm up in Seattle three hours away on a plane yeah. uh, they're, they're just four hours the car. by car and hell half the time people are going back and forth all the time anyways so it, it just really worked out I mean at the same time you got to a point in Australia where there are good guys there but if you really wanted to train with them on the regular you'd have to either you travel all hell over hell and back or have them travel all over hell and back and to do that every day there's no way that happened and there's no way that'd be useful to anybody so you had to pick up and you know go where you felt the opportunities lied and, and so you ended up in Puerto Rico in your own little heart of darkness <laughs> <laughs> which sounds hilarious uh, I could easily see uh, some Colonel Kurtz action happening and a lot of intense individuals oh, yeah. um uh, but it still got you where you're at, right? You're in, you're in Austin, you're running your gym, uh, you got your students, you're competing still when, when the opportunities show up and uh, you're forging your own way. And you can always go back to Australia, you know, they'll still take you. That's good. That's good. That's good. They got Lachlan over there, I don't think they want yeah. to <laughs> whenever, whenever, It's funny though, whenever I go back, they're like, oh, you sound like a fucking American, but here from time to time, people are still like, what the fuck are you saying? Are you from England? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aussies give me so much shit. Like, all it has to be is I say one thing wrong. Like, if I say grocery store, they're yeah. like, look at this fucking thing. <laughs> oh, God. They, uh, <laughs> they start to lose it. Look at this fucking yank. Yeah, look at him over here. <laughs> you probably didn't drink any Bundy. Nothing, yeah. <laughs> um, so you started fighting in Seattle. Yeah. Well, at what point in your career were, like, uh, you made the move down here in terms of, like, because uh, you were in the UFC... Before Z uh, Zuffer even bought it, right? Yep, I was in there. Actually, I was in Japan when the deal had already been had just been done. Oh, okay. So Fertitas were in Japan at this UFC regional event, this UFC Japan event. Uh, Tito fought Yuki Kondo, and I was there with Lance Gibson and Dennis Holman. And we went all went out that night. Uh, the Fertitas, Dana, Big John, John Peretti, who used to be the matchmaker, uh, you know, it was all like, okay, here are the new owners. Oh, wow. And then, oh, it's going to shake down like these are the, this, this person's going to have this job. And <laughs> none of it really worked out how everybody said it was going to work. But, uh, but yeah, I was there right mm -hmm. after the, all the ink had dried and everything. I was right in on that. That's crazy. Uh, but, um, for me, 
there was a world of MMA that was kind of bifurcated from Japan, Brazil, um, the U.S., and I guess you could kind of say Russia, but there, there was like moments within even the Russian MMA scene where things are kind of peaking and falling and peaking and falling. And, and in fact, Russia now is a more viable, higher level inter, international competitive space than it was kind of at times that I was in the UFC, but there was pride and that was huge. And it was, I don't, I know where the UFC is now, but throughout the history of pride, pride was, by far a bigger organization in every way than the UFC was. So it was really the best place to be. And then after the Ultimate Fighter uh, and the things that they've done since then, it now the UFC is the, the global name. It is the biggest dog in the whole show. But there was a time when that wasn't the case. Yeah. I miss the old like characters that were in the early UFCs and Pride. It feels like UFC guys are just like regular professional athletes now but like back in those days it was like there was just some crazy people involved. it's true and you know they're still crazy they just try to tamp that shit down <laughs> uh or they're, they're crazy in more approved ways yeah. but um yeah obviously the earliest ufcs were pretty crazy there was also what was that one the one that uh, uh chris haseman won in australia oh against elvis right yeah he put his like chin in his, in his eye. eye. Yeah, yeah. He he put his submission. chin in his eye socket and he tapped it off. <laughs> and then there was uh, there was yeah, there was guys like uh, I don't know uh, Daryl Bandicoot and <laughs> these uh, these these totally Aussie names of people you've never heard of and maybe never heard of since. But I think people were just it was pioneering. People wanted to go out in the frontier and see what they could they could catch for themselves. Also, nobody. Everybody had their own idea about how things were going to lay out. But until you get into that ring and you really start throwing hands and feet and everything, you, you just really didn't know. And so a lot of folks that maybe were able to win their scraps on the street every now and again is thought, well, you know, I'll just get in here and I'll do this, that, and the other. It's like, well, maybe you will, but probably you won't. Um, and seeing, it's also a lot more different when you could pull hair and groin shot people, headbutt, uh, grab the cage. You can put your kind of stuff. fingers in their wounds even, right? Uh, yeah, you could probably do that. Yeah, for a while there, that wasn't really thought of. Headbutts. Like, <laughs> yeah, headbutts, uh, no gloves. You just get out there and keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, but it, it was sexy as shit, to, to put it any other, any other way, because you really felt like this was blood sport. This was the kumite and... And you're just traveling around the world, like you from Street Fighter, just like, okay, where's the next challenge? You know, how, how good do you say, how, how good is this guy really? And he says he's a Kung Fu master. Okay, well, let's see how that pairs up with what I do. You know, how does it match up? That's so wild because, like, these days, the sport's so old. And the, like, we're not old compared to other sports, but, like, in a sense of we have, like, a backlog of techniques that we know. We know mm -hmm. sort of, like, that would never work. Yeah. But I guess early days, like you was, you started fighting how soon after UFC 1? Uh, UFC 1 was 93, and I started fighting, my first fight was in 97 of January. So that was that's still a period of time where you might be like, what, what this guy does might work. There might be some crazy shit I've never seen before. Oh, I mean, there was, okay, so from Jeremy Horn, I, we stole at AMC the uh, slip elbow. So you push, you press on their face, you're creating space, you just slip it and drop your elbow in. Right, so that was a thing, and then everybody, then they all stole the the crucifix from us. So at AMC, oh, we, we would take the near side elbow and flatten it, and put our knee over the top, and trap mm -hmm. that near side arm, and then just start going to town on it. And we even called it the uh, what was our name for it? The uh, what did I? We, we call it not the supermodel. I always call it the kind of the Burt Reynolds because <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So because as you're on top, the far side arm, you'd want to pin it between your shoulder and your neck, and then reach up and then capture it so that they couldn't get that arm back. And uh, it, then all of a sudden, Militich's guys see that they're like, "That's fucking sick. We're gonna start. <laughs> we're gonna start doing that one." And, uh, 
And so as we're going through these different stages, people are making huge game-changing differences to, to how people are approaching martial arts. But I think a lot of it is that these, a lot of the, well, Carl Gotch always says techniques are never invented, they're just rediscovered. Yeah. And then even within this concept of MMA, you are then taking something and you'll see different versions and iterations prior that didn't land. And then it's figuring out what what was the the little magic in between the thought and the application that where it was lost, and then how to how do you shore that up? I mean, even with all the leg lock stuff, um, uh, and, you know, it's funny because like you'll get you're known oh, he's a leg lock guy, a leg lock, and Gordon leg lock, and it, but it's like oh, yeah, well, their leg locks wouldn't be shit if they didn't have everything else, mm -hmm. right? You know, you can't go out there as just a one trick pony if you don't have threats in other ways because then they just they just uh, put all their defenses in, into that one area and then well fuck if i can't do that well then nothing's gonna happen i guess you know my game isn't there so uh but even then the leg lock game starts changing a little bit and what's interesting is as an old school leg locker it's funny watching i remember the first time people were coming up to me and talking about donaher and other stuff and i go what's this thing He's doing the shit we were doing already. Like the way you, you're attacking the top of the foot, the longest lever, all this. And my always thing was teaching that the, the heel has to go vertical, not across. If you really want and getting the Z, like getting the ankle and the knee alignment out of alignment. So now you've got tension across the ligaments that now you can snap them, right? Whereas if you don't have enough tension, he might be flexible enough or you're twisting it across your body. You're really going to pop his ankle. You're not going to pop his knee. Yeah. He's just going to keep going. And maybe tomorrow he's going to be like, oh, fuck, my ankle sucks, but uh, I won because I didn't tap and I managed to, to turn it around and either sub you in a, in a grappling competition or score the points or if it was a fight, you know, get in there. I mean, I've seen a guy with a totally blown ACL still fighting on one leg, like hopping around like from punches of people. So uh, if you're determined or you have enough speed, then you'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, and I mean meth. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it's interesting seeing that but then my whole thing was but all of this is initiated off the ground off your back none of this is attacking from the top there's no leg lockers that attack from top at all every leg locker goes off from underneath now I understand that a lot of guys who come from the jiu jitsu background so they're playing off back but also if a guy is standing over you their legs are pillared into the ground so you then play in and amongst that pillar to try and looking for those sweeps. And, and within that, that's where the leg isolation comes in. But as a catch wrestler, I'm like, fucking everybody pulls guard to do this. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> I hate this leg lock shit. Yeah, who would do do that? it on top. What kind of ass <laughs> pull guard? <laughs> I have an excuse being an Australian. We have no wrestling, you know? Yeah, but you've got yourself a nice little high goshi. One move, yeah, yeah one takedown. I just like every time you... Bounce one of your little idiot students. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. They, yeah. I mean, obviously, we edit out any of the times they counter it, you know? Oh, of course. No, 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 no. We, no, they don't, they don't get to be praised at all. They have to earn for that. They have to earn that right by doing it to some <laughs> other lesser student. But no, I mean, if you ever look on Craig Jones' Instagram and you, if you see my comments, it's usually like, yeah, kill him. <laughs> Beat up the plebs. <laughs> It is, it is fun to do. We always have the cameras going, which is crazy because it's like, uh, it, it's good to be an editing control of that, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, but it's also like there's eyes always on you. So I'm always like, I basically watch every single round I do now. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's so easy with technology to yeah. do that. Sure. Do you, do you find that it also breaks the mood in the room and that since they're there in it all the time, like they get less self-conscious and they just don't. Like they're just over it. Like, let's just fucking go. Like, we're all here doing the same thing. Everybody's fucking up at times, but also everybody's succeeding as well. And so here we are. We're all in the same boat. Some are better. Some are, some are worse. It, it's fine, but we're all doing it together. For sure. Yeah. If the camera is like, there's a, if you start filming everything in your gym, there's going to be like a three-month period where people are like, every roll is like a competition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's like, we just roll as if the cameras were there. Because it's like, yeah, whatever. If the guy hits a good move, we'll put it up. <laughs> Obviously, depending on which asshole that is. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. really, you do relax after a while with the cameras out. If they get you, they get you. It's funny, you know? Yeah. And then, obviously, if it's a visitor or someone, I'll sell them. 
that footage. Or the other All solution right. is something I do at seminars is if I ever get caught rolling with a guy, I'll let him get me a couple more times ah. because it's obviously it's believable yeah. that they could get you once. But if they tell their friends they got you three times, they're not going to believe it. <laughs> I love the psychology on this. <laughs> you you really them. work this through. This guy's evil, man. <laughs> evil. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because uh, of a lot, not that I know all of the, the, the guys that are really at the upper echelon of the grappling game. Uh, you know, I'm really more MMA oriented all the time with my athletes. I make them compete a lot, including grappling <clears> stuff. <throat> uh, any chance to compete is an opportunity to sharpen your competitive mind and to treat the it does matter yeah. opportunities uh, in the proper way and to build on uh, using that towards all competitions you will have. Uh, but I, I found Craig to be like really affable and just like, Hey, you're cool. Like right off the bat, this guy—he's all right. You know, I don't—I don't need to know him too well, but you just seem <laughs> you seem, like, you seem cool as shit. Oh, well, it was also kind of interesting because Gordon and uh, and Matt were really cool as fuck too when I first met him. Really, just like respectful. Not sorry, I'm not, I don't mean to ruin anything. Uh, yeah, he will totally talk shit about you or whatever. But yeah, it was just they were nice as shit, and it's good to see people really go for it with everything they got. And then get off the mat and be like, yeah, yeah, but we're in it together. And if, if there's no reason for us to be dicks to each other, then let's just keep, keep it going, right? Everyone likes to gamble. Some guys bet online. Some guys send unsolicited dick pics. If I were a betting man, I'd go to mybookie.ag and I'd throw in the promo code B-Team for a nice little bonus. We have coming up. Max Holloway versus Arnold Allen. You might be asking yourself, who's Arnold Allen? That's a fair question, because the guy fights once every solar eclipse. Max Holloway, everyone knows Max Holloway. Unfortunately for Max Holloway, he takes more damage than Nicky Ryan's fleshlight. It's a very intriguing fight, very important for the featherweight division. I'd imagine Arnold Allen, if he gets it done, he gets to face a guy who spent a lot of time training, Alexander Volkanovsky. Who am I picking? I'm going to go with Arnold Allen. He follows me on Instagram, and that goes a long way, my friends. If you want a sports book that gives you the most for your money, bet on next weekend's UFC fight night with my bookie. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes it is fun to be a dick. Of course. You know what I mean? Like, um, especially in jiu-jitsu guys, sometimes, and this, I love stirring up catch wrestling guys. I would say <laughs> the catch wrestling community is a sensitive community. Yeah, very sensitive. And you're probably the main reason I don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you this. There, a lot of them are super sensitive because most of them don't compete. And that's the problem. And... What they, a lot of them don't understand, a, a buddy of mine who, who's taken my seminars before, really good-hearted guy, uh, Martin Oz Oswick got in, in England, he put out a little video not that long ago that I watched on Catch, and he's like, Catch is going to disappear. You know, he had a really bold statement as the video, because you always have to put something like that, right? Like, uh, Gabby Garcia penetrates. And, you're like, and it was all over, like, rock over steps or something. You know what I mean? On a double leg. Don't get us excited. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, his point was that so much of what is within catch wrestling that is really strong and useful is just being integrated into jiu-jitsu. And then a lot of it is just kind of like being – nobody's – keeping track or no they're just like no it just gets assimilated and and it just ever nobody claims it or remembers where it came from anymore and it's true because jiu-jitsu being the dominant art form in how it's been spread around the world it's got the biggest competition it's got more competitors it's that's just the way it is you know it isn't it's not like it's purpose built it's not it's not that people out there think, ooh, you know, I'm just going to eradicate catch wrestling by, by taking it up and then just calling it all jiu-jitsu. I mean, it was never intended that way. But it's, you know, there's so much wrestling that entered into jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. at a point. Uh, but people just say they do jiu-jitsu. And it's like, well, I mean, yeah. and But you're also a wrestler in the amateur, like, takedown style sense. But you're all wrestlers and that everything we do is essentially a form of wrestling. So the catch guys without going out there and really competing it 
really hampers what's capable. And and I will say that there's not like a lot of really high level competitive types that can teach catch. But then the few of us that are out there, we're just doing MMA. Yeah. Um, so the other stuff is like, well, the juice ain't worth the squeeze to, to spend the time as a professional grappler. Uh, it's might as well go and fight uh, and make a whole lot more money and have a more open playground and catch could be, can be a massively successful in the professional grappling world at Abu Dhabi and all that. I mean, Darren Andy, Reese Andy's brother hadn't really ever done too much grappling and he trained under Matt Hume for like three months, something like that. He was a D1 wrestler from Minnesota. Looks like Brock Lesnar. Um, he wrestled 190, but now he was like 250. And he fucking took like third or fourth at Abu Dhabi. Oh, wow. So, you know, catch can work. Yeah. You know? But let's imagine you had Darren Andy for three years and six, three months. You know, it'd be a different story. Or watching Nicky Rod yeah. get right in there and... You know, I know he came from Donaher and he's under you, but it's like, bro, you're a fucking wrestler, first, foremost, and third, and then you do all your jujitsu like fourth. You know, you can talk about your body locks and your, yeah, that all came after all of your wrestling work, which it should because that's where you spend all your time and energy. You already you already developed skill there. Why would you get rid of it? You know, that's smart. Uh, and he goes out and he's top level in Abu Dhabi. You know, a lot of it off of wrestling. Right. But um, Abu Dhabi and wrestling and MMA, they all they're different games in their own senses. And maybe you put a gi on on Nicky Rod and stick him in IBJJF Worlds. I still think he'd do well because he's around us so much, but he'd probably fucking hate it. <laughs> probably like, why? Why are you doing this to me? This sucks. I hate it. Yeah. God, just get off of me. <laughs> I told, I said to him, actually, I was like, because we're, we're trying to do just funny things for the sure. YouTube channel. And I was like, me and you should have a gi match. And he's like, yeah. And then he's like, uh, but it wouldn't matter because I'd just take the gi off. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> this is genius, I don't think guys. it works that way. Yeah, right? yeah. That's actually really funny. <laughs> he always throws the airplanes at you like that. Josh, that's actually pretty interesting you mentioned that because I agree. I think like jujitsu is becoming a mixture of all these arts, right? Wrestling, a little bit of judo, obviously jujitsu. It has to um, be to be at the best. You know, you, you got to get that different edge. Do you think we get to this point that jujitsu, no, especially no gi jujitsu, just becomes its own thing, like submission grappling, and then the gi jujitsu becomes its own thing, or you think it's always just going to be we're just going to stay in like it's just jujitsu? I think it depends on the rule set, and, and I'll say this much: when I if I'm really talking about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I, I really mean the Gi especially. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using Jiu-Jitsu kind of loosely talking about even submission wrestling because so many people are Jiu-Jitsu based. So a lot of the rule structures and things you'll see, and even a lot of the offenses are Jiu-Jitsu derived. It's still basically doing BJJ in one way or another. Um, uh, but uh, I think the games, the game, the rule set will, will show you what you're going to have. And if all the rule sets are still oriented towards a jiu-jitsu methodology in terms of in terms of scoring and what is considered important and what isn't, then it will always continue to resemble jiu-jitsu in some way. And it's interesting in that even IBJJF now has heel hooks at Black Belt, I believe. And so in itself, that's now incorporating the more no-gi submission stuff now into jiu-jitsu. But... You know, if you do, if EBI, uh, if we're at EBI five years ago, then that overtime thing is now permeating all across yeah. the United States. Now you're you're training two different games at the same time. Personally, I hate EBI rules. I think they're awful. Yeah. Uh, not because of like, I'm like it's not personal. It's not meant to be a dig either. I, I get the point, and it was an intent to. Uh, to solve issues. Yeah. I get why and what Eddie was thinking when he created it. But but when you create a game structure, it is, it's really complicated, which is why generally when you see board games and card games and all these things, it's made by like crazy math nerd actuary weirdos, right? Because to think of all the different instances and all the different combinations happen, yeah. is difficult. It's really difficult. And so... I saw the first EBI setup because I was at EBI one with Victor Henry, and I'm going, hmm, okay, that's interesting. 
And then as I saw it get fleshed out a little more and more people are diving into it and, and playing with this game, I start seeing it then at amateur tournaments too. And I'm going, oh shit. The new thing is, ah, you're way better than me. Okay, I'm going to stall and squirm out the entire round. There's no points, so who cares? I'm going to stall, squirm, and just get us to the second game and then try to beat you there in positions that I would never get into otherwise. I'm like, I fucking hate this. I hate everything about it. I just sit there with the most like disdain just dripping off of me because I'm like, this is fucking fucked. I hate it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, just go out there and do your deal. Yeah, yeah it would suck when, when you would see a guy getting dominated. Yeah. Go to overtime and that guy gets submitted. You'd be like, oh my God. Oh, you see happen? it all the time, man. I, I hate it. Time. I absolutely hate it. I, I think they're awful. What do you think? Like a lot of people talk about how like using kind of like folk star rules with submissions. Like what do you think would be sort of the most? Have you been watching my catch tournaments? I haven't even put any of them online. <laughs> but that is basically how our catch tournaments are. Oh, I have amateur cool. and pro ones. The pro ones we don't have any scoring. But it's still we ref it like uh, an international wrestling competition. You know, don't play on the edges. You'll get called for that passivity and stalling. A lot of it has to go into the hands of the referee. You need referees that can move the game along how it needs to be and and penalize people for stalling and passivity. Passivity, obviously, being like what you might run into. If, let's say Craig Jones on the mat with, I don't know, Ronaldo Silva. Let's make someone up. That would be my <laughs> Brazilian Joe Blow. But, <laughs> and, and Craig is all over him. And... And, uh, okay, well, let's make it accurate. Okay, Craig is losing. <laughs> That's the fun. He's, he's getting, yeah. And then he's just like, you know, fuck this. Uh, I've got my, my Nicky Rod grease on. It'll come out in about <laughs> six minutes uh, once I get a good sweat going. And, uh, you know, I reek of, uh, I, I reek of uh, VB. <laughs> it's perfect. Got my digger on. <laughs> and you're out there, and you're moving around, and, you like fuck, man. This guy's just all over me positionally, and I just can't really can't get me. Won't let me isolate anything. And okay, so I'll just, you know, I'll just do all this, and I'll get to the to the overtime, and then you know, win there. Uh, uh, with the refereeing, if the guy's like, whoa, whoa, you're you're passive, you're being passive right now, boom, and, and call you on a flag, you couldn't use that strategy to get to the second game because you're not earnestly trying to win if the goal is to win by submission especially when you have no points and even then points are supposed to be they're supposed to guide you as to what the creators of the rule set the game think are the essential necessities like these are the things towards winning the way that we see it and so we will try to incentivize you towards winning with these points. And those points will then create pressure on your opponent to then have to react. Uh, I always tell people, uh, well, people, my students, when I send them into grappling competition, like score as much as you can when the uh, opportunity to score is there. If they're really, um, if they're really particular about keeping you away from the submission options, but you can score with position, score because Put pressure physically, but also put pressure with the score. Yeah. If they're behind 8-0, they got to start Hail Mary. Okay. Unless they're just going to still play tightened up and not give you anything. It's like, well, then they're just telling you, I'm too much of a pussy to try and actually win. Yeah. I'd rather lose like this. They and just don't want to get submitted. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like, well, have fun That's being a point, loser. Right? Enjoy your <laughs> enjoy your time losing, loser. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, um, when you're out there... And you're incentivizing these games. You don't have points. Okay. Well, then that ref has to be moving people along. And I'm not saying that's an easy job. And I'm not saying it's even easy to have referees that are that competent. Uh, because just being a really good grappler doesn't necessarily make you a good referee yeah. either. Or a good judge. You know. So it, it, I, I feel for everyone on this. Eddie, everyone. It's not easy to create these things. And uh, EBI did a lot for people, did a lot for you, did a lot for the Donna Her Death Squad in general, and a lot for, you know, these great guys that work under Eddie 
like uh, Geo and Freakazoid, or um, his brother, uh, yeah, Blue. down there. Blue. Those guys are great, you know. And <clears throat> having opportunities for people to grapple and make money has only increased uh, involvement, yeah. Uh, and as well as uh, T-shirt sales, it gives you your reels play money. <laughs> very important. Yeah, very important. We need those. We need that little three hundred and twenty <laughs> bucks from Instagram. <laughs> I, I always liked the idea that the referee was a very big, intimidating guy who would just talk shit to both of the grapplers. <laughs> Be like, this is boring. Your dad called you a pussy. Do something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You can incentivize it to embarrass me. So you want me to referee your matches? <laughs> that is it. That would be great, yeah. uh, The referee needs to be a figure of authority out there. And it's when you are refereeing, you need to make sure that... Whatever that call is, you need to make it. And if you fuck it up, you need to fix it right away. Mm -hmm. Whenever you make a decision, it's permanent. So if you stop something too soon, you fucked it up. It's on you. A lot of pressure being a ref, being a good ref. And uh, my students, when I send them into my catch tournaments, end up with me as a ref, which is like, oh, if you fucking fuck up, you are fucked. Not only am I going to fuck you right here, I'm going to fuck you when we get back to the back to the practice room too. Like you, there is no easy ways out here because I want you. I'm going to hold you to a, the highest standard possible because you train under me, and you should know what is expected of you and how I expect you to compete. Um, but I also do it because it's my baby, and I want to make sure that as people watch it and as others that I will then at some point tap into to be a part of that they see what is expected this is what we're looking for mm. now we tried hitting the mat to call our pins before you like, know that's ridiculous because you know fucking swatting the mat a whole bunch of times oh two oh two like, fuck this this is idiotic you know i'm not doing iron palm training throughout <laughs> the day i'm just trying to call a match so just you know sign up three count and trying to explain to people that my job is to not be seen for the most part, but to make sure that that match is being corralled so that it stays within the framework of the game. Yeah. And it's not easy, you know? Um, hell, IBJJF learned a long time ago that running a tournament isn't easy. Just that simple part. Regardless of their officiating, it, like, how, get out of there at a reasonable hour. Yeah. Like, oh, I won my division at 4. It's 1.30 in the morning and I still haven't gotten my medal. <laughs> Still waiting for the absolute. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see what happened recently? What What was it? Was it Nogi <laughs> Worlds last year? What happened? No, so Nogi Worlds, Usada showed up. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You this? No, but this is great. This is a good story. <laughs> I, I love that. I love. I just read an article about this recently about all the guys getting popped. Well, it was only <laughs> like four, really. Yeah. Uh, but then just going like, wow, you Usada, IBJ. What are you thinking? Yeah. What? Are, this is insane. This story is good. <laughs> Everybody's piss is glowing at that. Why? <laughs> right? And then at the same time, why wouldn't you want it glowing? Like this. This is how we're gonna get the the best advantage winners possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you move an advantage to two points. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But these guys disappeared. So they found that you decided was they gonna test them. So the podium photos had like four guys missing. So yeah. it was first and second, and then those guys posted photos online. They're like, I was going to be late for my flight. Like, yeah. I had to disappear, and then you saw it showed up at that gym in Miami. So the guys were like, oh, we'll just give up the medal, we'll just disappear, and then you saw it showed up anyway, which I don't think they've ever done. Yeah, first time ever, right? That's, that was a competition wow, test. Wow, that's fucking wild. Yeah. But it was just a fucking hilarious. Heard of the Josh Barnett rule? What's that? It had nothing to do with steroids. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> no. Um the Josh Barnett rule, as I was to understand it, was in 2007, I signed up to do Nogi Worlds, but I did it really last minute because I was training Victor Webster and uh, Amir Alam and Rolf Warner King. I have trained a bunch of 10 Planet guys uh, along with Eddie. Um, and I'm sure Eddie would tell you, like, there's a bunch of leglock stuff that came from, like, me and Eric Paulson through them to Eddie. And when Eddie was getting ready to, to face Hoyler, he's like, okay, his leglock uh, setup that he loves to go, Ho Hoyler loves to go into. Uh, he pulls, wraps, goes for uh, Achilles lock straight, and he's got a whole game. He works off of it. And so, 
you know, Eddie would send us videos and pictures about different stuff. And so we're talking to him about, okay, well, how do we do this? You know, here's the steering wheel, or maybe use this or that, or just take this apart, so on and so forth. And I'm working with all these guys. And I go, look, Vic, uh, I know you're an actor and you're Mr. Super Handsome Guy, but you train all the time. Like, you're legit. You should go and compete in this. You will only be young enough to do this shit at, at a small point in your life. And then that window will be closed and you can never get it back again. So you should go out there. And eventually he's like, I'll do it if you'll do it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fine. I'm in Japan pro wrestling. All right, I call up, uh, I'm not going to put any names down here, but a major dude with an IBJJF. Who, and I go, hey, can I sign up into this thing? He goes, sure. So I roll in, I'm in the brackets. And uh, I go, there you go. Now I did it. You got to fucking get in, asshole. <laughs> so he did. And uh, we're in this thing and uh, uh, I show up. I've got like some Ruka board shorts. I'm like they're too stretchy. I had to go buy Nogi. Oh, was it Nogi brand? That was Chris. Uh, yeah. God damn it. Why am I forgetting his name? I'm sorry, Chris. Yes, I know you if I see you in person. Uh, the West Side Strangler, Chris. He was down there in Huntington Beach. I know you're talking about Chris. Yes. Uh, fought in MMA for quite a while. Um, his kids are pretty tough, too. Anyways, shout out to you, Chris, whose last name I fucked up. <laughs> Brennan. Brennan, see, I love you, brother. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I had to buy those. Okay, fine. So now I have my my shorts and, you know, I show up. I'm in black belt and I got, I got no buys. <laughs> but, uh, and then the returning champ, he's got buys, but it makes sense. And I, I go through, I went first match by toehold super quick. And then I, I beat Tom DeBloss on, on points. And uh, that was a funny match. Tom will have to describe that match because he actually cracks me up anytime he talks about it. <laughs> I, I love Tom. Tom what, is what such is a fucking good guy. You have to just talk to Tom. He, right. he cracks me up. He said some shit. So we we talked even at we talked on the mat. We talked after the match. At one point, he's like, "I've never heard anybody just laugh while I did something." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, "I was in, having fun." Uh, but uh, we had a good scrap out there. It was super super awesome to be on the mat with Tom. Um, and then I, I wrestled uh, uh, this cat Bruno in the finals, who was a Half Crazy guy. And he actually had come and trained MMA at CSW, so mm -hmm. we knew each other. And he's uh, Mamut. He's, I think he's like six, six, five, long guard. And you know, he was very conservative of what he was doing down there. And, and then so was I, won by decision. Uh, Bruno Paulista, uh, good cat, uh, really great dude. He got into a nasty accident in Brazil really fucked him up, but he managed to recover. He's teaching, um, you know, he can't compete anymore, but it, it's great to see him that he's on the mats and everything. Yeah. So I got a lot of love for Bruno. Nice. And it was, you know, I, I also love the fact that we could be in the finals together, you know, going with each other. Um, and so I win. And then next year, you need to register your black belt that is legit. You need to make sure that you, your gym, all these different shit start popping up. I'm like, whoa, that's wild. I didn't do any of that. Because technically, I was not a black belt in any way. Uh, I had never even trained jiu-jitsu. I was a catch guy. And uh, everyone start. I started seeing all this stuff like, oh, yeah, that's a Josh Barnett rule. You don't just show up yeah. and then beat all the jiu-jitsu <laughs> competitors <laughs> and, get to, and get to get away with that. That shit is over with. Yeah, that's so tight on all the oh, restrictions yeah. and everything these days. I mean, I could I could see it if there was a concern that dipshits were going to end up in your tournament as a black belt, and it's like, whoa, you're not a fucking black belt. Uh, but I don't, I can't say that that was really the case. Yeah. Like everybody I saw on the mat seemed black belt capable, and obviously, being a black belt in jujitsu has it, it, it definitely does have weight because jujitsu is a uh, it's a merit and uh, results oriented process as well as the understanding. Um, but I, you know, you, you really can get, you can't get on the IBJJF mats as a joke with a black belt. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would just, not only would you get destroyed bad, they would, it would 
there's not there's not people bold enough to try such a stupid thing. Yeah, the fake black belts aren't gonna beat it. No. no. They don't even go They're not gonna pay for it and they're not gonna win any money just by yeah. showing up. So there would be no reason for it. So yeah, it's the Josh Barnett rule. So you're welcome for all of you that have to pay shit tons of money oh, to register <laughs> your shit because this stupid gringo went out there as a catch wrestler and won the world. That's how the conspiracy we shut down catch wrestling. Yeah. You get it out of there? We yeah, get it out. Here. Get it out. Fuck these catch guys. <laughs> Fuck them. Moves. Fuck them. <laughs> I just love, after we rolled, you just looked at me like, my neck feels awful. I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> I remember you actually demonstrated moves on me and my business partner Seth is here. I was like, no, can you show me on this oh, guy? Yeah. I was like, please do it to the full extent. <laughs> to the full extent. I want to see, <laughs> see it at the end. This guy's a terror, man. You're the worst. <laughs> you also had a random gi match with Homolo. Yeah. How that did that come about? Uh, because everyone that was there was like, oh, fuck, we're not wrestling without with this. It was a no gi <laughs> tournament. It was a no gi tournament with money, oh, wow. and I showed up, and they're like, "Well, I go, it's, I go, hey, this, we're doing okay. When's the, when's the final? It's no gi. Um, we don't know yet. Like, what do you mean we don't know yet? <laughs> the fucking flyer doesn't say that shit. So come on. And then they basically brought us up to the to the uh, I don't know this table or whatever. And they're like, okay, everyone, let's take a vote. I'm all. Asa Fuller looks at me and he's like, sorry, bro, I just needed, I, you know, I'm, I don't want, I need everything I can get out. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I raise my hand by myself. I'm like, oh, fuck this. And I'm sitting there and I go, I don't even fucking have a gi. They just turned this shit into a gi match out of nowhere. And Breakpoint gives me a gi and it's enormous because I had no idea about sizes. I'm like, I think I'm a, I think I'm a six in judo. <laughs> oh God, this is a, Fucking blanket, yeah. but all right. <laughs> like it's the wizard sleeve. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. First match was um, oh, why am I forgetting his name? Really good guard, really good competitor, world champ. Uh, he shoots an omoplata on me, and I'm like, okay, oh, take my arm out. Fuck, Otavio Souza. Oh, oh yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, fuck this. So we're sweeped. We're on bottom. And he's doing the pull the gi out stuff, trying to, and I'm just sitting here thinking, you're never going to fucking get any of this on me because <laughs> I have trained judo. I know how the gi works. I get while he's doing it. And, and, and in fact, it is quite clever and smart to use the thing that you would figure your opponent would be the least aware of. So all kudos to Otavio. He was actually being really clever. It's just that, I'm not that dumb. <laughs> so then he's, he's messing around. He's, he's doing all this stuff. Got good grips. All right. You know, he can't, he can't fucking help himself if I do this. Oh, no. I turned towards him for a mount. Whoosh. Whack. I took his leg. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately whack, hit the Achilles lock. Cinched the legs. He's like, he's screaming. I'm like, gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, really? Gotcha, cunt. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, in this case, it was, it's not, the thing is, someone might see that, whatever, and be like, oh, this and that, you know, all this hyperbolic bullshit. All it is is this, and this isn't to even downplay me, this is more to make it so that people do not downplay him, because he's fucking for real. I got to train with him later at uh, uh, this other location, and yeah, great guard, super slick, great training partner, love him. Like, he's fucking dope, right? He is a world champion for a reason. And it was simply because I, and I think we talked about this about back, back takes, right? I go, I said, I told you at the time, I go, look, if I start giving you my back, you can't help but go after it. Like, you're just like ingrained, this is what I do, which is, oh, I already know everywhere you're going, where your foot's going, where your hand's going. This path is so known to everybody, unless you're that much better than the person you're doing it to, if that person's good enough, you just put yourself right into a whole bunch of known knowns. Not known unknowns or un... No, you just threw yourself right down the fucking pathway and he fucking took the high beams on and flipped you, threw you off and did a Yui. It was the same with Otavio. I turned to him and I go, there's no way he can avoid going after those mount points. There's just no possibility. As soon as he did it, 
it was pop and you know, I could take the leg. Uh, with Home Alone, it was just a really knockdown, drag him out match, but uh, I, I got the knee bar, but I couldn't get the finish on him. Was it popping? Uh, I don't remember it making a lot of noises, but I, I guess I blew his knee out with the whole thing. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I, I found this out afterwards. Um, but by the end of the match, my hands start to went up from the ref, and there was a lot of Portuguese being spoken, a lot of anger, a lot of emotion, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, I, I believe, like it turned into carnival on the sides. Like there, <laughs> it was going, there was bundas and everything. I was like, "Fuck, man, this is this is for real." Everyone's drinking mate, and then I lose. <laughs> but. I wasn't super sore about it, mainly because my philosophy is like, if I don't get the finish, then whatever happens, happens, right? You could call it the worst decision in the world, but I allowed it to go to a decision, so I'm now subjected to that. And I like Homola, so whatever, it was fine. Uh, but he was limping around, I had some Toradol in my bag, because whenever I'm around, whenever I had to have surgeries, they give me painkillers, I put I fulfill the prescriptions and then I just keep them because I dislo when I dislocated my shoulder against uh, Krokop, mm. <laughs> I remember this. This is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, you're in Japan in 2000, I think it was three, maybe it was four. Either way, uh, I think it was four. Your, your, uh, your shoulder's dislocated and you're fucked, right? Properly fucked. Your you've got flats. Fucked. You know, you spun a bearing, you ain't going anywhere. <laughs> and, and you're sitting out there waiting for the bronze to show up. <laughs> I can't help it. Anyways, uh, and in Japan, you're like, oh, this is where the, the coolest cameras are made. This is where the high, highest of electronic technology is made in this country. And they gave me a straight up, like, torn piece of like cloth to wrap up and make a sling out of it this is like fred flintstone's bullshit right now and this is all i got and i got no drugs no, no drugs. nothing and now i got to get on this plane for 12 hours or 11 hours 11 hours and i'm miserable and so i go nah never again so i just pack this shit in my bags uh, I don't remember where I got the tort. Someone was getting getting some tort all. I said, give them to me too. Stuck them in my bags, and it turned out for homeless benefit that I had some <laughs> on me to get them to get them out of there. I go here, take these, drink plenty of water, blah blah blah. And excuse me, they paid out to both of us. They're like, oh, you know, the promoters are like, we think you want it. And yeah, I'm like, whatever, man. I'm here, take some cash anyways. I went out had a nice dinner, and then I see homeless at. Worlds. So this was before I competed at Worlds, I believe. I was there coaching folks, coaching Amir Alam and coaching some other Ten Planet guys and whoever was there from CSW if they'd showed up. Uh, and I see Homeland in a fucking full on brace and crutches. And I go, dude, what the hell happened? And he goes, you. <laughs> oh, man, come on. And he goes, well, you know, yeah, I guess I would. You know, I won the match, but it looks not like I, it looks like you won in the end. And I go, well, fuck, dude, you was just competing, and nobody, you didn't obviously think your shit was getting fucked. You just wanted to win. Uh, and we got to, you know, it was just a silly moment, it was a thing, but uh, I couldn't, you know, I wish I, I could have got the tap out of him, but I just think that, it, like, he was there that day, he just didn't, did not want to concede. And so it would have had to have been something pretty substantial to get it at the time. And, and honestly, Homola is such a dope dude. I love him. He is such a stud. Uh, you guys just, I, I know that we are so ahistorical these days that like we don't remember shit from yesterday or even last week is like it was 30 years ago. But folks, look up Homola Bahal. He is a fucking stud. He runs a killer program up north uh, with Gracie Baja Northridge. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't say any more about the guy. He's he's fucking super great. I love him. And and when I was getting ready to compete against Cyborg, uh, a brave for Metamorris, Metamorris four, I think it was. I think that was it. Uh, four or five. 
and he had a guy that could do tornado guard which I'm like what the fuck really is that I haven't really watched it much oh it's just that okay got it um and I he had me training with his his guy fucking another killer just awesome great attitude Homelo was in the room every day and it, it was it was sick you know it was great to be like Hey, we got to go on the mat and like fuck each other up. That was dope, man. And now here we are, like building each other up, and 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 your students getting built up alongside all this as he's helping me out. This is this is the way it should be. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the good guys. I remember I trained at Gracie Baja Northridge before I'd even won any tournament. Mm-hmm. It was nothing. And I remember after training, it was late at night. I was waiting out front for an Uber, and he pulled up and he's like Range Rover, obviously living good. And he's like, "Where are you going?" And he drove me like twenty five minutes back yeah. to my hotel. Queensland, right? <laughs> yeah, like a long way away. Uh, Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to your land. Yeah. I've seen your people. We let you in. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You let me fight out in Bris Vegas. Yeah, what was what was that event? Hey, uh, it was called like uh, pay me only a half of the money and then fucking don't finish the rest of it. <laughs> the didgery dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we, that's how we roll. With the exchange right now, that's probably an accurate representation. Honestly. Yeah, well, even back then, the thing that killed me about Australia is like, I know it's an island, but why the fuck is everything so crazy expensive? Why is just a plate of some sort of pasta here like thirty fucking dollars American? Why is it three people with each each like two glasses of wine and three dishes? hundred fucking bucks. We well, could for the accent. That's, it. That's not cheap. <laughs> fucking box. Yeah, <laughs> fucking box. <laughs> Thirty fucking bucks. What year was that? Because I think twenty thirteen, the Aussie dollar was worth more than the US dollar. I think it was like oh nine, maybe. Oh, nine. So, so it's probably at that time pretty similar. Now, you would live a lot larger with the US dollars now. I live, I live larger because I weigh more too. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, yeah. have some burger place called like Jacks. Hungry Jacks. Hungry yeah. Jacks. I believe the story is our version of Burger King um, is Hungry Jacks because someone already had the Burger King name mm-hmm. copyrighted down under. Yeah, I believe that's the story. <laughs> Hungry Jacks. I used to work there. You used to work at Hungry Jacks. Oh, wait, I did four years of hard labor there. <laughs> Hard, hard labor, like kicking the koalas out of the fucking kitchen. It was, yeah. uh, it was a nightmare. You know, those ten hours a week. I don't think I can do it again. <laughs> I don't. I don't see you as a wagey. I just. I just don't see it. Yeah. You know, any way that Craig could find like a freezer to hide in or whatever, that's where he'll be. That's it. That's it. Hide it. Also, I don't. I don't take you as a cook. Okay. Yeah. I don't cook. Honestly, I'm a big Uber Eats guy. <laughs> No way! <laughs> are you, are you getting, do they sponsor you on that? They help you out? No, sadly. I mean, it's a good tax. Uber refund, Eats. But... Look, if you don't fucking step up to the plate, <laughs> this fucking guy right here, he's he's going to get stuck in with... Uh, hey, what's another brand? With uh, Grabhub. Yeah, Grabhub. <laughs> Grabhub. Grabhub. Grabhub sounds more Australian anyway. <laughs> I mean, Grabhub, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking back, Homolo, you hurt his knee, and then he's taking some bad injuries. I remember he got his knee blown out of the tournament. He was in a toe hold against oh, Patrick Gaudio. Patrick Gaudio. Oh. He just ate it. The Gee Worlds, right? I've never been compelled to do that. Uh, me neither. If you get it, take it on. You got it. Oh, no, uh-uh. No, uh-uh. It's like, hey, yeah, you fucking got me. All right. <laughs> fuck. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, well, I got to do better. And, and, you know, it's similar... It didn't, this didn't come about, but even when I wrestled Dean at Metamoris, everyone goes, you're in my fucking shoes? What are you, an idiot? No. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And so it was, this was also kind of funny. Show up at the match, everything's going. Commentators are like, wow, shoes, against Dean Lister. <laughs> okay. Have you been concussed? Way more in MMA than we expect. <laughs> what kind of mental deficiencies are you bringing to this you know, exchange? And uh, then by the end of it, this is also funny. It was, you were 380 pounds, so Dean Lister couldn't do anything. I was like, the guy was like 225, 230, and I was 250. Like, we were well within the range. <laughs> And then, uh, and then it was like the shoes were were an unfair advantage. I'm like, wait, what? Whoa, what the fuck? 
I'm an idiot. I'm going to get my leg torn off and thrown into the stands while Dean Lister drinks the blood out of the, the, <laughs> the fucking leaky stump. And then it's, oh, you cheating fucking sneaky bastard, you Craig Jones. You have figured out a way to game the system with your super indestructible Iron Man uh, fucking Stark Industries wrestling shoes. Which is it, assholes? But either way, um, the whole thing behind that was my thoughts were, we ain't getting into a leg battle. It's just, if, if he can get to my feet in a way where I'm compromised with the shoes, then I fucked up way, way too, more steps than anything having to do with the finality of that exchange. And so there was one point where he did try to go after my legs and, like, and I stopped him and cross faced him off and cleared him and, you know, as we go on. But the thing was like, no, I'm not getting into this shit because at the very least, as a strategy con consideration and as a consideration towards my opponent's mental attitude, his mental well-being, his mental health, his mental health day. Uh, if he gets in on my leg, he feels like he's got a shot. He's going to get some kind of boost towards what he's doing, thinking everything could have been shit up to this point. But here I am in a territory where I know I can literally win against the best in the world. I can win world titles. I can win the highest of high titles if I'm in this position. Now, whether he does or he doesn't, and even if he lost there, I don't want that guy who's being underneath me and dealing with a bunch of pressure and bullshit and whatever and, and having a hard time to now get a, a shot an invigoration into him to go, I got, I got an opportunity for that confidence level all of a sudden to shoot back up and for him to now feel like he has his opportunity to turn everything around right then and there. That's dangerous when you have someone as fucking good as Dean Lister. I wouldn't do it with you. I wouldn't do it with anyone, you know, because everything can go great. And then it, it doesn't turns, it. Like, turns all the way to that guy simply because his his what he's feeling internally has now just fucking taken a huge leap, right? If everything, especially if everything has been bad, um, you know, if I've been head and arm right you know, and just being sweaty and gross and heavy, and you're just like, get off me, you piece of shit, and you get to my leg, and, no, you don't want that. You would not want that. Although that's not what you do these days. No, no, you got new stuff. Me, I mean, he just stands up. only for the purpose of selling instructions. <laughs> <laughs> if I competed against you and you wore shoes, I'd be like, he wants me to go for his feet. He's up to something. You know, I better not do it. God, two wily fuckers. Yeah, <laughs> now we're like, <laughs> this sneaky bastard. Like du double, double confusions here. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, like, but does he wear the shoes because of this? No, it's actually a double. No, no it, it isn't a trip. It's a no war. I could easily be tricked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's too obvious. He's Remember this, me. everyone. He's, he can be easily tricked. <laughs> I'd be like, he's making me look like an idiot. With <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just little little things like that. You never want to fight somebody where they're at their best. Even if you can beat them there, they always feel like they got a shot. So they're always going to be strongest in that position. So even if I was fighting a guy who's a grappler, like a Frank Mir, I'm going to keep it on the feet as much as I... I mean, there's other things to, to that strategy, to entering that fight. But in a simple sense... He's a great grappler and a great finisher, right? Well, regardless of what you could say about, um, you know, positional stuff and sweeping and all that, if he gets a hold of something, he's a good finisher. Yeah. And you don't want to give him the opportunity to feel like this is, cap this is an availability to him. You want to keep them in a place where you can drown them in discomfort. And then that will give you the opportunity to, to find that window to then shut that fight off. Yeah. Uh, having them fight where they're strongest, even if you're strong there too, it just creates a bunch of problems that you don't need or potential problems anyways. Yeah. yeah. For me, that area of discomfort is just if the match has gone for more than three minutes. <laughs> I'm like, let me have a guess. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> hell. I hope this guess thing's bad. Oh man, what the hell did I sign myself up for? I thought you're supposed to just like jump in on something and then we tussle around a little bit and I get you and then <laughs> now here we are. Fifteen minutes later. Fuck. 
if they beat me when I'm tired, they didn't beat me my best. And I, and I, I can rub them with that victory. <laughs> That's all right. I was, I was tired when he got me. So, you know, if it was 16 minutes ago, I totally would have won that. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a strong philosophy. It's Over. pretty good. It's, it's hard to beat, really. It is. It's hard to finally find you fall in it. Um, so does Gordon Ryan hate you now? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Why does he hate you? You're 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 just poking and playing. Oh, it's so it's too bad. <laughs> it's pretty. It's the Aussie banter. Some of the Americans don't. Uh, yeah. you know what? I don't take Gordon. I take Gordon as a more. He doesn't seem like a banter guy at all. <laughs> <laughs> at all. Yeah. And this is coming from me, Mister Intensity. But I just don't think he's he's just not really built to be a bantery dude. Uh, for whatever reason that may be, it could be just personality, it could have been stuff, uh, other stuff in his life, it could be other things. But um, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate because I I watch the banter and it's <laughs> hilarious. I love it. Uh, but also, um, I don't, I don't, I see you as kind of like a Loki figure, but you, you don't really, you're not like, you're not really trying to like, like really put a dagger in anyone about anything you like fucking with stuff but at the same time and and, and and if if gordon can relate to this i would say it's in this um i have never and, and people can correct me if i'm wrong people including you i, I keep australians are people too <laughs> um but um uh, I don't really see Gordon making excuses about getting beaten by people. Like, any of the times he's lost, he's like, nah, he got me. He beat me that day, and that's that. And he doesn't bitch or cry. You don't see, like, it's not a there, which is one of the things that I liked about him, a lot, or, or still like about him. It's like, he's not pissing and moaning about when he's lost. He's like, nah, you got me that day. Whereas, in the same vein, you will banter and fuck with people, but you are not a person who's like, well, you can't, you expect anything you do to be done to you and then some. You don't consider yourself immune from any of the, the like, uh, you know, the banter, the goofing off, the, the roasting, like none of it. Like you're. Oh, I enjoy it. I yeah. enjoy it for sure. It's funny because like the banter works so well with him because he will only come back with, well, you suck. I'm the best. And I'm like, but I fucking said that. <laughs> and, then, and then when we go back and forth and the fans get involved and the fans start saying things to him, I think it, it doesn't make sense to him because he's like, how can these people laugh at me? I'm the fucking best. Yeah. So it's like a... It's not about whether you're the best. That's the thing. It's like, we know you're the best. You, it can't be disputed yeah. from the things you've done. And you're probably like with almost seemingly autistic level to detail is awesome for people that pay attention to the things that you put out there. And it's great. This is all great. Uh, the Mayweather style of promoting has its place. You shouldn't lean on it too much. I don't know why I'm acting like I'm talking to Gordon right now. Uh, <laughs> Cause mind you, I like him. I really do. Um, but, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it has like a certain lifespan and you don't want to get into the place where all anybody wants to do is just see you lose yeah. that. I mean, you can make a lot of money off of that, but eh, it's just got such negative undertones within it. It just, it sucks, right? It, it can at times take away from all the good you've done. And there is lots of good from what Gordon has done in, uh, competition and I would say even uh, his instructional stuff like putting his thought process and the way he breaks things down out into the world and it goes for you too you know these having a peek into people's minds is wait actually if I'm talking about you that's probably a bad idea <laughs> but yeah I don't know how do I fucking say anything because my fucking fucked up head is out there teaching people how to break people's shit too so <laughs> uh, I guess I don't really have much of a, of a leg to stand on if I'm going to really cast any stones here so um, but it, it's good uh, to have that in the world um, but honestly I think he could be it's not for him but if it, if it could be 
it'd be hilarious to watch you two like fucking banter each other. I just think like the whole world would literally just crack up about it and get a ton out of it. The one thing I will say though, Nikki shouldn't have said what he said. Nikki Rod. He should Rod. not have said the fucking thing about steroids. He should never have done that. Oh, about Gordon and steroids. Uh, oh, should have okay. done that. Did you see he just tested clean? Uh, oh, Nikki. Yeah. Oh, oh, I saw the no plates, more Yo, plates, more dates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it came up in my feet somehow because uh, YouTube figured out that I like fucking sweaty men grabbing each other all day long. And uh, so I, I, I ran it. I, I went through the rundown. <laughs> Part is the guy's like, Nikki, it seems like you're going to die of some oh, crazy yeah. disease because <laughs> you have weird numbers in places that don't make any sense. And please don't get your leg cut off. <laughs> Oh, you're <laughs> diabetic. Yeah, you're pretty yeah. diabetic. He's just like, I'm just Ginzo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Jersey and I have a lot of pasta. Yeah? It had a good effect on him though, because what was crazy, we actually. He it was, is smart to do your blood work, by the way, as yeah. an athlete and just any normal person, because look, we live in a world that will serve you fucked up, chemically ridden garbage yeah. all day long through Uber Eats. <laughs> and uh and you need to really be aware of what's going into your body and what it's what sort of things that's happening to you and you can use request a test to just go and pull up run a blood panel and they'll tell you what i mean they're not going to give you more information besides like this is within what the acceptable range is and this isn't but it'll it'll help you out yeah. and anything that, that's like 200 and some bucks. If it keeps you out of doctor's offices, trust me, it's fucking worth it. It really is. The problem for the jiu-jitsu guys is they're spending all their disposable income on the steroids and can't afford <laughs> to get the actual blood test. <laughs> I guess, yeah, that's a fair criticism. They're like, yeah. do I do the IPJF this month or do I get my hormones checked? Yeah. Like, well, we're going to compete. Yeah, no, we need to, uh, we need to run our cycle. So... <laughs> This ain't happening. That G GH ain't paying for itself. <laughs> yeah, that's expensive. Um, Jiu-Jitsu's probably the dirtiest combat sport right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, easily. ADCC. <laughs> oh, probably. Yeah. Uh, maybe slap fighting is worse. Oh, oh yeah. Man. But probably not for steroids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd want something else going on. PCP, into that. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. How do you what feel did, about yeah, what How do you, do you feel about that? The power slap stuff? It's awful. Yeah. You it's know, so it's, it's absolute garbage. And I'll caveat it with this. There are people participating in it that I've met that are good dudes. They're, they're getting them. Look, they didn't make it. They're just taking advantage of the opportunity. And so I get it, you know, but I'd rather see people do something more traditionally sport and athletically yeah. minded. It's just, it ain't healthy. But in this day and age, in this state of modernity we live into, like everyone wants to sell everyone's selling their ass and shit online why wouldn't you just yeah. get <laughs> I actually I get mean, a fucking CT you know, real, for $2,000 a real, <laughs> yeah, a real really slap like, upside the head right you know I ran this idea by Chael Sonnen and it was something so we obviously already have <laughs> he already looks hard <laughs> we had we have combat jiu-jitsu yeah and it goes to overtime why don't we just incorporate power slap <laughs> as the overtime you would never see me look for submission faster than if I had to have a slap off with my opponent afterwards. <laughs> Give me a real sip for you. I can't right. help it because you're saying this in a very logical, rational <laughs> way. But all I can think of is fucking Craig Jones. <laughs> I, you know, like wearing like a leopard thong going into the slap competition, just dropping his jiu-jitsu shorts <laughs> off. Like, this is all fucked. This is all. He didn't even want to win the jiu-jitsu match. He just wanted to take it, drop his drawers, and sit, get fucking. It's just really upside in. You're not a leopard print guy? Uh, <laughs> you're a real animal, I'll give you that. <laughs> you know, everything in the outback they say is, is, you know, venomous or, you know, is trying to kill you. You can easily fit within that prescription. Uh, he doesn't have any venom, but, you know, he's got things that you can't get rid of. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. A lot of STDs in that blood panel. <laughs> <laughs> That's a blood panel you always like. Uh, yeah, I mean, getting getting slapped the shit out of you. I, I will say that people who created the slap stuff, I, I got to talk to some of the guys that compete in this, and there are rules that, that someone has thought of 
to try, uh, I guess, to reduce the severity of, of the blows. But, I mean, there's just only so much you can do. Yeah. I mean, there's things about pivoting and um, your stance and all that. But, I know, I can't, I can't back it no yeah. matter what. I, I would rather see these guys continue to have mediocre MMA careers than to beat the shit out of themselves, uh, you know, taking turns doing that. Uh, but the money... In this is a recession. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Everything's fucking sucks. It's expensive. And someone's going to give you thousands of dollars to stand up there and get blasted in the face. But you also get a chance to blast them in the face. And we're not even talking about porn. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> There's no that way that was a like a sober idea. Like, I wish I was a fly on the wall for the first conversation. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, it must have just been a bunch of fucking... Russians over there is like, nah, you know, <laughs> fucking slugging, not even vodka, but samagon, like their, their moonshine stuff. And it's like, hey, you are, I think you look like American pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're like uh, Putin's uh, foreskin uh, cheese. <laughs> oh, do you? We could do power slap, but with leg kicks. <laughs> Fuck, Jeez. that's awful. If it's a draw, if, you, if it's a draw, you have a race. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dry guy. Yeah, I would be the spring. You thought of this. That's, yeah. that's the craziest you, thing. When is this happening? I want to be flying the wall when you're thinking about this shit. This is absolutely happening on the B-Team channel. We're looking for more business ideas. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is just a front to find more ideas yeah, for the YouTube exactly. channel. <laughs> I just want ideas by people like Josh and just wait. I'm like, oh, you didn't laugh. We're onto something here. <laughs> Maybe it a consideration, yeah. Oh man. oh man! Uh, yeah, that would be that would be wrecked. Uh, one time I was wearing a T-shirt that had uh, one of my my mentor, one of my major mentors in pro wrestling, Antonio Noki's on the shirt, and me and Victor Webster were at uh, Earth Cafe in in Hollywood off Melrose. And it's it's a to do spot, and he runs into some folks that he knows. He, he's a couple of these, these gals, and we're all chatting. And this one gal looks at me and he goes. That man put my dad in the hospital. I was like, wait, what? Because what you're saying really limits the scope of who that person could be. And uh, your skin color is a lot darker than mine. So that limits it even more. Holy shit. So it was one of Ollie's daughters. Oh, really? Oh, and really? she's, yeah, and she, it, was, it was her and Kenesha Norton, I believe. Uh, so they're... At Earth, they run, oh. run it as well, having a conversation. Yeah, and when all these, that's that guy put my dad in the hospital. Oh, damn. She's like, Yeah, so after the match, you know, all those kicks in his leg and everything, the hematomas and everything were so nasty and so bad that he had to go to the hospital yeah. to recover from it. I don't know how long he might have been there, like a week or something, but the damage was pretty fucking substantial. Yeah. And I knew of another guy that got into a K1 match who. Well, there's two other examples. One was, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the boxer. He fought Masato in K1. And this guy was a world champ. And he got kicked in the leg, I don't know how many times, and it fucking fractured his femur. And then there was another guy um, who fought in K1, and he got ripped in the leg so bad, Chad Bannon... He had to go to the hospital. Was it Andy Hug that like hit a speed oh, back? Now Andy Hug hit Mike Bernardo. Did that break the fracture? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that was the case. But yeah, he threw that spinning heel kick, but right into the leg. Nasty as fuck, dude. That would suck. He'd be getting hit with like the the round end of a ball peen hammer. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't use those guys. Just you, we get the same guys that do power slap. <laughs> Have them kick your leg. That's yeah. on their off week. Right? <laughs> uh, I feel bad for the kid that got his leg snapped at your, oh. at your gym. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No one, by the way, I know that when you watch it, especially if you're not really inundated to training at a high level all the time, it seems like, how did you not see that coming? No, it's because everyone's in the room all the time. No one saw that coming. No one, not only did anybody think that anyone would literally throw something hard enough to do that, but also wouldn't tap. That was a crazy... But it was one of those sideways time. things, right? Is he Which is, in one end, 
unless she really felt it was worth it, that girl should have known better than to fucking do one of those tricky, nasty. It's like getting in a knee knot position and then straight rotating and straightening the leg out and just snapping someone's knee in half. Like it doesn't, you don't even have to apply any heel hook or anything, but when you're in the knee knot, if you take the top leg and you rotate and straighten it, that fucking caught leg blows out. So don't do it. Like, it, okay. Even, even, look, you didn't win the fucking, the respect of all of women across the world. You didn't all of a sudden just, uh, uh, increase the gender pay gap on your side. You didn't accomplish that. You just fucked up some guy's knee to oblivion. What, the craziest thing about this story was when we were like, we're letting it marinate before we posted the video, we we're really discussing our options that any woman I told that story to was said, like, you go, girl. That was the <laughs> attitude. Any dude I said that story to was like, yeah, but what if the roles were reversed? That was the response. Oh, yeah, no, that would have been absolute <laughs> napalm yeah, everywhere. That's that what one. the guy said after that. were like, that's probably the worst thing that could have happened. And I was like, well, no. well, I'm lucky. We're lucky he no, didn't. If he did that sideways bullshit to her, <laughs> everyone would have been like, what the fuck? You know, how could you do that? And uh, at certain levels, yeah, some of these girls, I mean, I, I think that Helena Jiu Jitsu girl could probably explode your knee if you give her the opportunity. How uh, is she 15? She looks. Uh, just she's big. big. She's a big girl. Strong, right? A bit older, like it's like 15, what? 16, right? Yeah, at the Crazy. eyebrows of a of a twenty seven year old. That's where we a, a probably yeah. that, that girl is serious as fuck. You know, she. I hope they her... never clip that video. How is that girl fifteen? <laughs> I'm just thinking about that in my head, actually. Uh, you know that that is she is clearly on a vision quest. Right? <laughs> that is someone who is dead ass serious about what their life is going to be, and. That's not about being a woman or being or a girl, I guess, in her case, or being a, a boy or a man. That is something that is rare, straight up. Like, you just will not see that very often. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm glad she found something to do because otherwise some building would have got exploded or, <laughs> like, you know, that, that, that's a kind of really serious, intense energy yeah. that needs to be funneled in the right direction. And it's good to see it put in, in that place, in that in that way, you know, I, I guess maybe, um, did you connect the eyebrows with the building blowing up? Was that the connection? <laughs> I thought the vision no, quest, because that was good. Dude. <laughs> she's, she's fucking, she's badass. Like, yeah. but that's, and that, she wears leopard print. She wears everything, as far as I can tell from <laughs> the, the post from Gordon. But, uh, yeah, that, that girl is like serious as fuck. And it's, it's tough enough to find guys that want to be that serious about it, right? Oh, I don't think I've ever been that serious about it. <laughs> I think you're pretty fucking funny because if you didn't have some level of seriousness approaching that, you wouldn't be where you're at. I don't believe that you are that one possessing that much natural talent. I just don't oh, buy it. Right. I put in the work for sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your attitude's very different, but when it comes to it, like the your ability to take in and also properly... Look at where you're at and where you need to improve and just being super honest with where your weaknesses and strengths are and building around them and all that. I mean, you don't necessarily have to be as intense as like Helena, right? But, uh, and, and I'm saying this as someone who has never met this person, right? It's just only what is pr projected on uh, the media space. But you see that and you go, well, that's not the only way to achieve the same thing, but it's also really fucking great to see that there could be a 16 year old in America that actually gives a shit about something that much. Uh, I mean, fuck yeah. that is one of the rarest things to find anyways, let alone now a fucking Gen Z or younger. You couldn't imagine anybody like really actually fucking being able to concentrate on anything more than five seconds. And she made a decision to, go down there and train under John and do all this stuff. And it's like, that's a huge undertaking because in doing something like that, it's not just about what you are saying you're willing to do, but you're also saying you're, you're, you're presenting yourself in such a way with your body of work to that point, to that person you're looking to mentor under and saying, I won't, I'm not going to waste your time. 
It's fucking heavy. Yeah. And she's only 16. Yeah. What's wild about it, too, if I had a 16-year-old, or if, I think she's still 15, if I had a 15-year-old daughter that showed me a picture of John Danaher, I was like, I'm going to go move to Texas and train with this man. I'd be like, we're going to have a conversation. You know what I mean? You know, something might be wrong there. <laughs> Sorry to kill you. <laughs> serious. Yeah, he was. He went on like a two minutes serious talk. You just fucking ruined it, bro. What the heck? Well, Elena, you, you're kicking ass. I mean, that that's a fact. This <laughs> gets the worst. For sure. Yeah, I actually did see her compete for the first time at a local tournament. Wow, what just was crushing it? people. Crush. Yeah, she crushed. Actually, she keeps beating all our girls. Actually, we need to bring in a bigger girl. A more dangerous girl to fight. I, I would, would say she needs to wrestle. Oh, cool, Gabby. You could call her. Like, Gabby, come take this. I would say me. she needs to wrestle. Being that young, like, that's an opportunity that will not come back again. And I don't think she, not specific to her, but any of the, like, really heavily invested jiu-jitsu girls would understand the difference between... I'll say this right now, and this isn't to like shit on jujitsu or piss off jujitsu people, but jujitsu folks, unless they're at the upper, 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 and even at the highest echelon, you have no idea what it's like to be in at the top, top highest level of wrestling. Yeah. Like the environment, the intensity, the structure, you have no fucking clue. Like that is harder than practically anything I can think of. And that kind of environment makes and breaks people every single day in a way that jiu-jitsu doesn't. And if she's that kind of person that has that kind of intensity and drive and uh, will to to forge her path like that, uh, USA Wrestling could absolutely use something like that. And I would not expect her to do anything but have success uh, and maybe even she could be a person that could be an Olympian or Olympic champion if she applied it into wrestling. But my, I, I think that even she would find like, holy shit, this is a different level. Yeah. This is a different concept of how you train and how hard the training is and how rigorous it is. This isn't to discount John or anything like that in any way. I've never even been to any of his sessions and clearly he has a, a very good mind towards developing people and an autodidactic way of breaking things down and looking at them and compartmentalizing them, uh, which is great. But yeah, getting in that wrestling, uh, that wrestling ladder is fucking nuts. Like that is intense as shit. I've worked with Olympians on the female side and male side and trained with them and had them be a part of my camps and, wrestling at like at that level is the tightest you could ever find it is really nuts how hard and how small those margins are between those guys and gals at the olympic level but my whole point about all this is that i personally think that would take someone like let's just say helena who's like kicking ass take her to a level that almost no other female she'd meet on the mat yeah. would understand or be able to match. Yeah, for sure. Be unbeatable, right? I mean, she already seems basically yeah. unbeatable at this point. It's crazy, 15 years old. I know. Yeah. Right. It's very impressive. These kids, that's, I always say this. I'm always like, I'm glad I'm in a slightly heavy division because you come across less kids. You know, like, <laughs> it's bad enough to lose. Yeah. It's awful to lose to a child. Yeah, just have some other old man smelling like fucking Newports laying on top of you. It's all right. <laughs> But uh, you got some kid who's got his parents in the crowd, and he in between rounds he's playing on his fucking Game Boy or whatever. Yeah, that's embarrassing. Yeah. That's what we actually like. Speaking of this, we had a guy show up to our gym, Joseph Chen, seventeen years old, bleach blonde hair. At one point, he even had painted nails. Cool. And this kid had only trained, I think, for two years in China, and was already hanging with some of the best guys in the gym. And I was just completely mind blown. But that's also. Insane. Adds insult to injury. When you just look at this guy, he's like a child. <laughs> just doing so well with you. And you're like, what? How just is keep possible? here. Just as long as you don't get a boner, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, realize that he's taken everything you've taught him and gave to the CCP. <laughs> I mean, not only that, he has illegally taken my instructionals, spread them to China as well. Oh, no. He's a man with no respect. 
respect for your intellectual property rights. He is, he is the Jin Yang of your yeah. gym, if you ever watch Silicon Valley. <laughs> I haven't watched it. It's a great show. It's, it's fucking game. great. Uh, yeah, you never know where that star is going to come from. You just don't know. And, and, and how could you? Because a person like a Helena or this Chen kid or any, like, even Gary Tonin, Gordon, yourself, Lachlan, you just don't know where they're going to show up. Because if you could find them everywhere, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be the elite. And right when we're at, when we're talking about the people at the top of the food chain, regardless of how long they may sit there, you don't, that's a rare person. That's just the way it is. Um, you, you're not going to be able to craft a whole team full of those people because it's hard to find one in the entire world. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you make do with what you got. When you build something that can draw them in, that's fucking fantastic. You know, uh, Harry Gretsch flew out to train, a uh, student under mine, flew out to train with Donna Her. And uh, hell, when he brought up about going to, I was like, yes, please go train with Craig because he's got great guys there. You've already, you know Craig already because you're both Australians. I'll go, I guess he's half Kiwi. So really? Does that make it different? He hid that from me. I wouldn't have trusted him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he already knew Nikki also from training with him at uh, Donna Hurst when they were at Henzo. And I was like, yeah, this is fucking great. You know, um, anytime you can get out there with, with a room like that, with these kind of guys that you don't get to train with on the regular, fucking make do of that. I actually want to send a couple of my athletes to come train with you at some point just to see, if, you know, what they can pick up from you. I mean, they're not, they're MMA guys, but yeah, I mean. Definitely send ugly a man because when Harry Kimura was coming around, I was like, guys, don't bring your girlfriends to the gym today. <laughs> you know, that's you know what's so funny? Yes, he is a handsome cat. He is a very handsome guy. But uh, uh, Harry is so straight and narrow. You, there's no you don't have to worry about shit. Oh, he's a good guy. Yeah, not when he grabs a Kimura, but he's no, 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 no. Yeah, <laughs> no. I remember when he got back from Donahers, uh, and he's like. He was already a leg lock guy, but now he's doing, uh, the Donaher guys really love the, what I call like, um, pinning the leg to the floor, right? So you get the outside, you pin it to the floor. Now he, his foot stuck not only under your hip and your body weight, now you've got your elbow and I call it digging for the heel hook, where you're popping the hip up just enough to expose the heel, give it a little light and catch it. Uh, one of the, my training metaphors is if, if the heel seal is light, it's in danger. Uh, and Matt Hume is actually really fucking killer at that kind of heel hook. Like, at one point, he was so nasty with it. If he could catch an outside, uh, an outside leg catch and pin that fucker on the floor, I don't care who you were, you're getting subbed. Like, and I watched him being down in Abu Dhabi, even when he's not competing, like smoke high level dudes over and over and over and over again and get on the mat with him. He, he was he was fucking unreal, but that particular move he had an insanely nasty front choke, and which is why when you're jumping on my neck, I was like, this is okay. <laughs> it's clearly it's it, it's it's dangerous, but it's not fucking Matt Hume. Send your Adam's apple <laughs> in your fucking stomach, bad. Uh, and that heel hook of his, he would stick that foot on the floor. So when I saw a lot of the the Donaher derived either directly or just from watching, getting that trap in that foot on the floor. It's like, yeah, it's because you can't get your fucking leg back, right? So it's a, it's a really great way to set that leg attack up. Uh, I did have one question. So, yeah, Harry came back, and he's trying to fucking hit all this shit. I'm going to be like, fuck, you fucking asshole. <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to get one over on the, on the, on the trainer, you know, on the coach. He's coming out. Yeah, it was great. And he's strong as fuck, too, yeah. Jax, how... Why do you let your student call himself Harry Kimura? Shouldn't it be Harry Double Double Rissler? He was Harry Kimura before I before I got him. Yeah, so. Harry Kimura works a bit better. Clothes a bit better off the time. <laughs> Harry Double Rissler? I'll admit, it's way too much fucking it's too much to say. <laughs> <It's enough. laughs> yeah. No, it's ridiculous. Harry yeah, fuck off. I'm not saying all that. What okay. do you think of all the names in jiu-jitsu where they keep changing names. No, oh, like Banana and Gorilla and uh, throw in a different language. Maybe. Android 19. And, <laughs> yeah, all of it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess in Brazil, everyone's a nickname, right? I'm surprised it's not more like nicknaming Aussies. 
right? Oh, you mean the actual athlete? Oh, sorry, I meant like the names of uh, moves. Oh, I, I get it in a legacy sense. So Kimura in his match with Elio, Kimura, I get it. Um, Americana, because the American wrestler was down there doing it. America, uh, these things make sense to me, and in a, in a deeper sense, like it, it doesn't bother me in the least. Um, in a particular is kind of just like, eh, you know, putting my scent out there in the world. Yeah, I'm gonna be like, no, it's a double wrist lock, you know, because. And I could even really get into the argument and go, well, you know, you know how you got Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, don't you? Well, yeah, well, you know, Gustavo Gracie and this and that. And I go, yeah. What did that Gracie patriarch do? Well, I don't know. Well, he ran a circus. You know what else he did at that circus? No. He ran pro wrestling catch matches. And the guy that fucking taught you all, that started us whole fucking trend with Mitsuo Maeda, Count Coma, was a judoka, jujitsuka, and a catch wrestler doing pro wrestling in your country. So you have Brazilian jiu-jitsu because of catch wrestling and pro wrestling. Now, one of the best Gracies back in the day for picking up for the honor was George. What was George? Well, he trained jiu-jitsu with, uh, with all the Gracies. Guess what else he was? A catch guy. So it was, back then, it was less, um, it was less separated because pro wrestling was generally legit, straight up. And so guys are doing catch and they're doing pins. They do matches where, okay, these guys are going to wear jackets for the first round and no none for the second. And, and they might take up an indigenous style uh, depending where they're at. And do rounds like that or do the matches that way. And it was just about entertainment and combat sports. And so ultimately, it's not really like a big deal if you consider the historical context because everyone was trying to find a way to compete and even as you look at it the Gracies and the Fada side they're also trying to forge their way to have combat sports as an outlet to express the martial arts that they're training and I often at seminars will give the example that if you looked at old Brazilian Jiu Jitsu like the roots type stuff it's no guard pulling it's all throwing and, well, like either, right? Yeah, and a lot of mount stuff because they want to get that topside control, get the option for the chokes and the arm bars, but also to strike because these people were fighting, yeah. you know, when, when they were doing a lot of different stuff. The original Valet Tudo matches were trying to be an expression of our martial prowess. It wasn't just like, I'm going to prove that Jiu Jitsu works. It's like, no, I'm a martial artist. We're martial artists within our group, and we're going to take on this challenge. And nobody really considered mixed martial arts. It was more like, well, this is us, and we believe that we are the best fighters with what we do, and you also, and so then we're gonna, we're getting to get in the ring and see how, how, how it lays out. And so people weren't really thinking of these grand, well-rounded games. And uh, I'd heard something recently about uh, Kimura even talking about doing karate training in the side from people that he had learned from and striking makiwaras and things like that which uh you're not going to see like the Miao brothers like doing karate out of nowhere because they're very uh regimented jujitsu athletes who also pop for steroids at one point which is insane that's but, right they did right but whatever you know fucking sick dudes very very good what they do but they in this day and age it's people are going to funnel into where where the opportunity lies and so it's like they're not out fighting MMA and Marcelo Garcia did it once I was like yeah hell that shit yeah. <laughs> uh, whereas back in the day it was well where's the opportunity right the opportunity could be anything but there's not there's not like a whole international market outside of maybe a few things like professional wrestling back in the day which could have even some variances within like I said you could do jacket matches if you're jiu-jitsu versus uh, wrestling or catch wrestling and so okay we're gonna wear the jackets this round and we'll take them off when Ad Santel uh, brought the wrath the Kodakon on him because he beat the world champion in jiu-jitsu and he goes well I'm the jiu-jitsu world champion now because I fucking beat him and the Kodakon's like oh what fuck you are so they just kept sending badass after badass and then there was this huge to-do 
at Yasukuni Jinja in Japan. These matches out in the shrine, and he won both of them. One of them by like slam, but he had to wear jackets to do it. Mm-hmm. He didn't wear gi pants, but this was the way the rules were set up. And eventually, Ad was like, uh, "That's enough. Okay, I'm not the world champion of uh, judo anymore. Please stop trying to kill me because <laughs> you guys are fucking tough as shit. So uh, I'm done." Uh, but that was how things were available. Whatever was available to you, you'd work it out and you'd go out and do it. Even Jack Johnson, the world boxing champion, when he left the United States and went to Europe, he had catch matches over there too because he was a combat athlete. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, we can specialize. And so a meow would never have to go out and do any of that stuff. And I don't even know that it would even really be that much of a consideration because I'm like, eh, well, why? I, I'm dedicated to jiu-jitsu. You know, I'm doing my thing here. And, and I'll do no he, but ultimately I am a jujitsu guy, and this is this is my thing. It's <clears throat> true. Yeah, got some interesting stories of all the <clears throat> weird challenge matches and stuff going on back in the day, right? Yeah. I think Jack Johnson even had a fight in Australia. That's he might have, yeah, yeah. He was uh, the U.S. was shitty to him, so he's like, you know what, the hell with this. Uh, everybody else knows I'm the world champ, so I'm going to take this show on the road and see what I can do with it. Explore some Australian culture. Let's finish up and plug this, Josh. Yeah. How long How long has this been out for? Uh, now, this is the single barrel stuff, the War Master Edition. It's only been out since, uh, I think, 2019 or 2020. Uh, Sespe Creek was going before I met them. They had Warbringer as their, their main spirit, which is basically the same as this, except it's a blend of barrels for consistency of flavor and taste and, uh, and nose with... Uh, it diluted down to 98 proof. This is cask strength straight from a barrel. So on this one, this is, oh, nice, 35. Barrel 35, and it came out at 112 proof. So 60, or um, 56% alcohol. Uh, It's like, yeah, Bundy territory. (laughs) Bundaberg rum. Bundaberg. How'd you get into whiskey, man? I had Chad George on my podcast a couple of years ago. And he was talking about this. This yeah. is like right around COVID, so I don't know. You said this is, you've been doing this for about two years? Uh, no, I've been doing it since uh, 2019. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so what, what got you into uh, well, doing your own whiskey? Surprisingly, when they reached out to me, I was already trying to create inroads with different mm-hmm. distilleries because I wanted to produce a whiskey on mm-hmm. market. And, you know, celebrities had put out booze before, but it was always like vodka and bullshit. And they were pretty much just white labeling stuff where someone would make all the juice and then you would just put your label mm-hmm. on it, right? But for me, I was a huge whiskey nerd. I really kind of got into it. My parents always liked whiskey. Uh, but... When I was living in Japan, I had access, and I wasn't much of a drinker, but every now and again, I'd, I'd have some. And I could just buy Amazaki 18 and all this different shit for hardly anything. It wasn't very expensive. And we just kill bottles of this stuff. It was, it was great. It was wonderful shit. But there was so much going on that learning to appreciate whiskey allowed you to have so much more enjoyment out of the whole thing. And it's not just about like taking shots or anything like yeah. that, uh, or even cocktails. It's just, you know, sitting back, sipping on it. You know, if you're going to have your vice, make the most of it. Yeah. And, and alcohol is a vice. Tobacco is a vice. These things are vices. Do them in moderation, but also get the most out of it while you can. And I just really fell in love with whiskey uh, and also the fact that it has like this heritage aspect to it where um, so much of it can be traced back to where it started. And, and me, even as a martial artist and as a combat sports guy, it's not just the whole catch and pro wrestling stuff. It's all of it. It's, it's knowing where Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu came from. It's knowing that there were you know, different camps that had their own flavors on it, like Fada like in leg locks and people like... Uh, uh, Ivan Gomez and then uh, the Luta Libre guys, which are really catch derived, but then they were amalgamating karate and other things into their stuff too, because they were getting together with other people that were martial minded. And everything about this, even the Aussie history of MMA with your Chris Hastman's and Elvis Sinisix and the people that I, I know through that, all this shit is really important to me because you are made up of the days that led to here. And to understand that allows you to make changes now and for the future and to see where you came from and to also to, to, to learn from that and to also reincorporate which was, which was lost back into what you have now. Um, it, what's funny, a little bit of a tangent, 
Billy Robinson was teaching this seminar and he just, and I can promise you, Billy Robinson does not watch, does not watch Marcelo Garcia shit at all. But Marcelo had this whole like arm drag, uh, single leg setup that he would do where he's dropping and he's hooking a leg with his inside and turning, coming around. Fucking Billy Robinson's teaching the very same fucking technique that he learned it back way back when in the sixties or fifties or who knows how old. This is an old school freestyle single leg setup. And somehow by being on the mats, Marcelo Garcia developed a similar concept himself yet with never having either paths cross or even Marcelo probably coming at it from a, you know, classical freestyle perspective. Oh, he was just doing his thing and wrestling's wrestling. So it'll come about the body only moves so many ways. And he's trying to get this guy from their feet to the floor. Okay. Well, you know what the restrictions are, you know, where you want to get them. Uh, but to just see that, right? And just go, man, this shit has been here forever. And this, so much of this has already existed. And to keep that alive, to keep those names alive. And, you know, that'll be the same. If I'm old enough for people, they need to know who Marcelo Garcia is. They'll need to know who uh, Homolo Bajal is. They don't need to know who Craig Jones is. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to help you forget. Yeah, it will definitely help <laughs> definitely you forget help. if you have enough of it. Uh, so I, I, with, with whiskey... You know, there's a whole lot of um, stories built into this and old distilleries in Scotland. The story of Japanese whiskey of, uh, what's his face? Um, he was the original distiller at Suntory, but he learned how to make whiskey by going to Scotland. And he brought back a Scotch wife and, uh, and then he eventually left Suntory, uh, Masataka Takatsu. Uh, and then he went and started and he went to Nika and they created their distillery because he wanted it on a similar longitude as Scotland. So it could be more like making scotch because the, the environment would be more similar in terms of the temperature changes. All this little shit, right? And I absolutely eat it up. I eat it up. And uh, I, I enjoy the product. Uh, you can get fucked up on it if you want or you can just have a good old time. Yeah. Uh, but I realize that, you know, drinking's not for everyone. That's fine. And this is smoky as shit that might turn some people off, but to be perfectly honest, you know, not catching for everybody either. Right. So that's fine. Yeah. You know, you, you find your, your market, mm -hmm. you find the people that are into it and you do whatever you can to try and reward them for yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And he also mentioned in that part, you, are you still doing this? Uh, he mentioned that you're open up like a restaurant. Now you have like steak, whiskey, maybe watch some fights. Is that happening or what? No, no, that would be fucking dope. He said, he, uh, I wish that could be the case. I mean, my house is kind of a restaurant full of right. steaks and whiskey and, <laughs> you know, cast iron skillets and, uh, you know, I, some, I sous vide steaks sometimes and sear them off in a cast iron skillet and ghee and, uh, yeah. With a nice yeah, glass nice. of whiskey. I've, I've had him over to my yeah, house uh, and do whiskey tasting, trying yeah, to get Chad uh, a broader perspective on what he likes and why he likes it. And, and that's the thing is uh, I try not to, to shame people about what they like about whiskey, you know, whether you want to have ice in it or not, or some water or no water. It's all good. And, you know, some people are like, well, I don't like, I don't like Irish whiskeys, but I like uh, scotches and but I'm not into, none of that matters to me. And, and even then, I'll, I'll, I love to pride myself on taking a, a bourbon drinker and getting them into scotch or vice versa or any of those sort of things. Mm. Uh, because it's it just opening people's horizons and giving them more things to enjoy in the world it, it, that can be as tough as this one is, it, it's fucking nice. Yeah. Awesome, Josh. Thanks for coming on. Second podcast ever. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I really hope you can bring the most... Craig Jonesy, Jonesiness out of yourself <laughs> to, to do these podcasts because uh, you're fucking hilarious. Uh, I hope you can get Gordon on here and I hope he can have a great time with it. Um, we'll give him a couple whiskeys. Oh, fuck yeah. Well, that might make it worse. I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, I like Gordon. I do. Uh, I don't even know Nikki. He's such a ginzo, uh, as my buddy Chris Dickinson, my student, would tell me. Uh, I think it's hilarious. 
listen to him. I, I listen to you guys on Lex because Lex is a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. I had to hear him. <laughs> <laughs> I almost thought you were just almost too much for Lex. It was great. But, uh, you made him uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. I fucking love it. Um, but, uh, I mean, when we, when we really look at it, it'd be great to have rivalry between uh, Donaher and B-Team, but also it not be... Uh, not be uh, what is the word acerbic and, and like caustic no we can have a, it can be intense but ultimately you guys the more you guys interact the more you guys compete the more you're out on the mats against each other and against others only the better everything else is going to become and what are we if not trying to create the best out of ourselves and therefore from that have that bleed into the thing itself and create the best out of it too by raising that level by you know gordon's crazy like four hour videos of just intense discussion about it's it's awesome and there are people that are going to need that and there's people that are going to need your way of approaching and my way of approaching and all this different stuff and we're all on bjj fanatics so buy all of our shit buy that um and through this kind of stuff we're living in a golden age where Practically everything is at a person's fingertips if they want it, right? And you can say, oh, these DVDs are these DVDs. I don't even have them anymore. These extractionals are expensive. It's like, bro, every single one of them goes on sale like yeah. every week. <laughs> the day so, season. And, you, and, and if you can't find a way to make 60 bucks, that's a you problem, not anything else. You could figure it out if you wanted to because I know there are fucking crack addicts. There's a homeless crack addict. <laughs> That we, I was on a ride along in a nasty fucking part of LA, and this, and the cop, the the officer goes, that dude pays for his habit by doing this, 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 and this, and he gets a little bit of here, a little bit of there, and go on side quest. He's always, yeah, that guy, <laughs> eternal side quest, yeah. and yet <laughs> he's always flush with drugs. He's always able to get his fucking high, yeah. and if it's if if you think about what you want in life, if you can't approach it like a crackhead then you don't really want it that bad. You really don't. Uh, I, can, I mean, when you, look at, when you look at Gordon, that dude's a crackhead towards what he wanted. So much of us are crackheads towards what we want. It's for real because it's, if you don't love it and want it that bad, it is way too much suffering otherwise. I mean, you know, Craig Jones is the, the funny, affable banter guy, but you don't get it. This motherfucker has suffered at times to get where he's at. Like, there was a lot of work put into it. Like, that that high ghost, she didn't show up out of nowhere. You had it to develop it. A lot of work? Yeah. And a little bit of crack. Yeah, yeah a little bit of crack. <laughs> if you can do anything, <laughs> then, you, then then you could do it a little bit better with some crack. <laughs> work ethic. <laughs> yeah, you think, you think steroids are the way? Fuck, you've been fucking up the whole time. <laughs> do it the Australian way. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be my product, not a whiskey. A crack? Yeah. yeah, a nice crack. Vegemite. A nice, uh, Vegemite for yeah, he'll have a little Vegemite crack, huh? With butter <laughs> on some toast. That's, 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 that's disgusting, bro. <laughs> if you go down the street a little bit, I bet you can find some. <laughs> how it. about that pile of like, burnt out garbage oh, across, right. the, across the way? You, like, you, didn't, you see that one? That truck just covered in like, old couch cushions yeah. and piss ridden <laughs> fucking. Uh, mattresses and stuff like that. Didn't see that. <laughs> well, that's what you're saying tonight. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no more room in there. Welcome to LA. Welcome to LA. You'll be, you'll be at, at some point. You might be just calling out like, "Just please, a funnel web crawl across my foot." I'll, I will take that. <laughs> that's a good way to end it. Thank you, Josh. Josh, right, before we go, that camera right there. Uh, any plug where they can follow you, your your whiskey, yeah. all of it, into that camera right there for us. This one? Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, you can get Warbringer whiskey. Uh, go to warbringerbourbon.com to find any store locators. Look, if Craig could find it, you can find <laughs> it. Uh, this is the War Master Edition. We don't have a lot of this available because we do it as a single cask, meaning that whatever we get out of that cask, that's all that's available. After Angel Share, however amount of bottles we can make, that's all that we can put out there. Uh, we do email uh, blasts at times where... When a new batch is released, uh, we'll give an allocation towards those on the email list. So I would suggest that you sign up for it. 
have Bloodsport 9, my pro wrestling show, coming up uh, this Thursday uh, at the Ukrainian Cultural Center here in Melrose. But it's completely sold out and has been since February. Uh, but you can watch it on Fight TV. If you are a subscriber to Fight Plus, there may be an option to pay-per-view it for, I think, like $19.99. But I'm not really all that familiar. But go check out. Fight TV to find out how to find uh, any details on that if you're a big pro wrestling fan. Uh, myself, John Moxley, Kode Ibushi uh, coming off of his leaving a New Japan pro wrestling contract and we're the first place he's stopping. Um, other than that, go to joshbarnett.com to keep up on everything I do. Uh, it has all of my links to social media like jo at Josh L. Barnett on Twitter and uh, Instagram as well as Josh Barnett Official on Facebook and anywhere else you might end up. I think my MySpace is still there somewhere. Go <laughs> uh, to OnlyFans if you want, Craig. <laughs> and uh, yeah, check out my instructionals with BJJ Fanatics. I'm gonna shoot a bunch more um, coming up this summer. And my stuff so far, we've got some leg lock stuff like Achilles lock, toe hold, knee bar, uh, as well as uh, double wrist lock work and the precursor to just stand up, basically, <laughs> with my uh, catch wrestling uh, uh, ground ground bottom bottom defense work, uh, because in catch you can be pinned, so you don't want to be on your back. Uh, and and yeah, listen to this podcast, watch Craig make a fool out of himself and everyone else around <laughs> him as much as you can, and, and get in on the banter. If you find a chance to say something extremely clever and witty, not just spiteful and mean. Please throw it at Craig. If it's just spiteful and mean, throw it at Gordon. Because <laughs> it's probably only going to energize him, to be perfectly honest. Uh, if he said something funny, he'll just take it as spiteful and mean anyways. So it's okay. Um, yeah, yeah. He, you won't hurt his feelings, I promise. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, man. Appreciate yeah, yeah. it. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. I can subscribe. Peace out. Thank you for listening to the El Segundo Podcast. Don't forget, fuck cry Jones. <laughs>